soup's not bad. Not today. I like it. You know, um, we can eat some more toast. Um, could somebody call the Toastmaster and get us some more toast? <laughs> Toastmaster? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, they're not Welcome having it to today. <laughs> Welcome to Progressive <laughs> Soup. My name is David Stevenson. Tonight we have a guest, April Winsley. April has written a book, Where Are You Going? And if, if you're sitting home watching the show and you don't know where you're going, April will explain to you where you're going and give you some great ideas on how to get there. April, identify yourself, introduce yourself to... Uh, the audience and uh, let's go from there. Perfect. My name is April Dawn Winsley. I'm a new photographer, I'm an author, and kind of a modified self-help coach kind of thing. Um, I started taking pictures um, after I knew I was pregnant with mm -hmm. my first daughter and decided that I wanted her to know everything about the world. So I took some pictures, decided I loved it. And then a um, couple about a year ago or so, somebody asked me what I was doing with it, mm -hmm. and the answer was nothing. It was something I did as a pastime, and then I realized there were some things going on in my life that I wasn't happy with, and somebody asked, again, what are you doing with your photography, and I decided that I was going to create an inspirational photo book, Excellent. and it kind of melded from this idea to what we have now which is basically questions and pictures and it all came from the fact that I realized change is happening all around us. People are being downsized, people are getting divorced, things are happening to people and I want things to happen for me. I want to affect the change. So in my very small way I created a scenario where we have these questions and pictures to kind of help you get there. So so it sounds like a, almost like a self-empowerment situation. It really situation. is. Because I'm not, I'm not assuming to know what you need to change in your life, but maybe there's something that if I asked you the right question, all of a sudden the answer would move you to do something different than you did yesterday. So that's really what it's all about, is making change happen for yourself. But, you know, people say, hey, how you doing all the yeah. time. And everybody answers. The same thing. All right. You know, I'm doing fine, making doing it, fine. doing yeah. it, whatever. Instead of actually taking, giving it, taking, taking stock, taking account of how life is for you. Exactly. The good, the bad, and everything in between, and, and identifying those things. Of course, you know, some people, obviously, that are not close friends of yours, you know, they're just as happy if you keep it... <laughs> Fine, mm -hmm. but probably people that are closer to you in your life probably want to hear something a little more than just that. Exactly. More, more even that, that I care about you enough to go, okay, what's stopping you from doing yeah. this or that? Or, you know, one of the questions is about fear. Nobody likes to talk about it, but maybe, just maybe, if you realized your public speaking fear is just silly, then you would kind of, you know, dig into it a little bit more, get out there, do it, and then you, you know, you could do something more than that what you wanted to your whole life, you know? And, and fear as we know, especially from political political campaigns, we know fear is a powerful motivating force and it's something that if we don't control it, it'll control us. Exactly. They us... use it against you. Oh, yeah. They, you know, they, they, they tempt you in. They scare you away. So, and what's going on in your life that you're afraid to do, mm. you know, that you haven't taken the chance to do. Yeah. Um, one of the questions is, again, like the whole change thing, does change suit you? Change does not suit me. <laughs> At least it didn't until I realized that if I wasn't willing to change, then how could I expect good things to happen? Because change doesn't always have to be bad. Like, no. my hair used to be down to my butt my whole life. Whole life. It was the thing that I held on to. Don't cut it. An inch now, at the bottom. <laughs> now, if, if I were to tell you that my hair used to be pretty close to down to my butt... <laughs> I wouldn't believe you. No, it's, it's been, as the, the audience knows, it's been a little bit longer than this, and I go through periodic changes of that, uh, just to prove to everybody that it's it's really my hair. It is yours. It's not a wig. <laughs> I have good hair, and sometimes I let it get a little longer than than some people might like it. 
<laughs> but I, I decided basically uh, about nine months ago that if I wasn't willing to change my hair, how mm -hmm. could I think that other changes were going to happen? It's hair. Mm -hmm. it, it grows back. It, yeah. it's, it's the ever-changing thing that always actually ends up the same. If you cut off an inch at some point in time, the inch will come back. So if I'm not willing to make those kind of changes, how can I expect a new job to come or to meet new uh -huh. people or to create new ventures? Well. I'm not because I'm kind of happy with not having change happen. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's been fun and it's been fun talking to people about it. So many people don't, are, are kind of unhappy with where they sit in life right now. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's been really, really fun to kind of. And a lot of us could be in a better place. So even if it's a, just a little bit better place than we are, there's always. Exactly. Uh, it changes our, our nearest and dearest friends, friend in life. Mm -hmm. It's always there. And unless we make the changes, changes will come from external forces. Exactly, exactly. I want to promote the book a little bit because it's got a lovely front cover. Um, as you can see, it's got the highway with a double stripe, which means it's a busy highway in order to have a double stripe, no crossing either direction. And uh, it, it explains pretty well what's inside the book. You're traveling somewhere and you're, you're the master of your destiny. You really are. And if you don't ask the question, mm -hmm. it's kind of like putting the address in your GPS. Your GPS can only get you so far. Yeah. So you really have to ask yourself, where are you going? And at the end of the book, actually, one of the questions is, are you going one way or are you going your way? And so many people feel like they're kind of cattle and they're being pushed into some direction that they had no say in. I talked to a widow who realized in an instant their, her kids had, um, her, her husband had passed about a year ago or so, yeah. and she was, you know, starting, the starting the morning process, and she realized she had to, to clean out closets and so forth, but her kids came in, swooped in, and said, you can't live here anymore. You need a smaller place. You need a condo. We need to do this. We need to do that. And she said yes to everything. And, and in an instant, in reading that one question, mm -hmm. and it wasn't even intentional. It was just the question for her. She was like... I'm not in control at all at this point. And it was the saddest moment for her because she realized she wasn't, she wasn't the one who knew where she was going. Everyone else was planning and mapping out her life. Yeah, so Maybe it wasn't the right direction for her. Exactly. Even if it was a minute from now. Yeah. It's it, just a presumption that, that when you're older, then well, you need to, um, to go into a different situation. You need to make exactly. other... You know, when, when, you're, when your spouse dies, that's a huge change right there. Exactly. But to complicate it further with other changes, well, maybe in time. Exactly. But, you know, a uh, little at a time, perhaps. Not, not such a huge change all at once. Exactly, exactly. What other people have you, have you, have you met that, that helped you create a book to help other people and to give other people some sense of how to give themselves self-guidance? I think most of all, I mean, I'm not one of those people who gather friends around. I, I have true friends, and those people actually have been such a comfort and a help with this because they've allowed me into their house with my book and go, okay, let's talk about this. You know, would this be something that would affect your life? Um, and I think that's been the most fun is actually becoming closer and opening up with friends and family because we wanted to talk about it. Was this really a relevant book? Like, would you put it on your coffee table and open it up sometimes? And and that's really the part of the size of it, part of all of that, was with help with my friends and family who were really willing to go, okay, I'm going to answer some of these questions for you and with you, and I'm going to ask you them back so that you can't just, you know, make me answer them and my husband has been a great great help with all that and my daughter she was one of the reasons why I wanted to do this I wanted her I really wanted her she's little now she doesn't and the quite reference get it. to Toast Smashes of course was a reference to the fact that uh, <laughs> April's husband Wayne is is in the Bethel Barnum Square Toast Masters with me and uh, yep. and I know April through Wayne and uh, and yeah. so it goes. Yeah, and he's helping me because he's doing all this speaking. So he's helping me figure out because that was one of my that was one of my fears was public speaking was talking about things. And what I realized was it's not about me. It's really about the people that I speak to. And in all of this, I really hope that I can touch someone's life with each time that I open the book, for as much as I'm proud of it for me, I really, really hope that somebody takes it seriously enough to go, okay, this one really kind of 
felt funny or this one I got this one I just figured this one out yesterday mm -hmm. Woo! And, and and they start running with it because now it's a reminder that they did that and and yet going back to Sadie she's been perfect for this she's little she's only three and a half but I have to tell you she's a my biggest fan other than my husband and B Aww. she looks at it and she she asks about it and she asks questions and I'm so excited at the idea that she's gonna forever be able to ask herself these questions and what a great gift I was to hoping. give to a child, <laughs> than, to, than to give them that little bit of that little bit of. Uh, of course, small children need most of their guidance from mom and dad, and they like to have mom and dad be right. a mom and a dad rather than being their pals. Like right. I grew up, I grew up in the yuppie generation, and saw it. so many people, so many adults, some of my contemporaries trying to be friends to their children and the kids you know like you know all well and good but uh, mm -hmm. you know I, I've got enough friends thanks mom and dad <laughs> would you mind being a mom and dad and give tell me what to do until I'm ready to tell myself what to do right but um, what a great gift to give to a child that as she grows as a person can have that gradual gradually increasing sense of empowerment self-empowerment Exactly, and that's and, what I'm and, really hoping for. With empowerment her. comes responsibility. There is and that. With responsibility comes empowerment. It's it's just a great human confidence builder. It is, and I think for her, she's going to learn also how I saw the world, mm -hmm. in visually, which is why it had to have pictures in it because I think pictures do tell a million stories. You know, you just one simple shot can tell you so many things about the world in that moment. And so yeah, being able to show her how I saw her world while she was growing up is just a gift that I couldn't imagine that was in there. So I love the photography end of it. That is really my niche. And it's so different now than when I was growing up where I have, you know, when I was little I had a bunch of little black and white photos. Just a very sketchy outline. Mm -hmm. Of what life was like growing up, and it's you, you kind of there's a lot of gaps to fill in there, and you just don't get a sense from just a bunch of black and white photos. They say that it's, it, a lot of people say that it's, it's it, we, we, too much information, too much uh, too much observation of our lives, too much videotaping, too many events being videotaped, too many photos, too much too much. Uh, of every sense of communication that we're too busy looking at ourselves and we can be a little too observational of ourselves. But no, I think in a way it's very good to have that opportunity to, to look back on ourselves periodically and, and know where we were and watch ourselves mature right. and develop. And I think there's a big difference between taking in our world mm -hmm. and sharing that part of our world and sharing the fact that we just went to Dunkin Donuts on our iPod. You know, that's a totally different. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree socially that there is way too much information out there. I, yeah. I, I don't need to know your whole business. <laughs> but if you and your family and had a picnic. Have, don't we all have been friends on Facebook? They're, they're, oh, my. <laughs> God bless them. They're, they're wonderful people. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes they tell that you need, don't need to know exactly when, when they're uh, what they're doing every minute of the day. Exactly. Though that's the part that's fun when they show the pictures. Mm -hmm. So that part I love. Friends that I don't necessarily live yeah. in the same state, they've had a picnic this weekend or like pumpkin season. They've yeah. just done their pumpkins and it's wonderful to be able to see that activity that they did. And I'm here in Connecticut going, look at this is what we did this weekend. Yeah. I love information for that, but yeah. yeah. And we can, we can pick and choose, you know, when, mm -hmm. when, when our, those friends of ours that do a little too much posting on Facebook, <laughs> you know, it's, it's up to us to, to pick and choose what exactly. we, we can we can watch and observe and comment on what we'd like to and, and you know and and let the rest go exactly exactly it's, it's up to us we're <laughs> we're empowered we're empowered to be um to be as observational and as and as complimentary or, or uncomplimentary to our friends as we we care to be mm -hmm. it's a social skill in and of itself exactly maybe that'll be a class that they'll take in high school someday mm -hmm. <laughs> Social skills 101, you know, mm, this is what we I should suppose. and shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I, I'm loving, loving having the ability to kind of go out and touch lives and, and just talk with people, kind of find out where they are. I'm very much, you know, I, I love knowing where you are in life and love knowing that I can help in any little way that I could. So that's really why we kind of did this. Let me take a pick for the book. I just want to. I just want you to comment on a couple of shots that I noticed going through. Okay. 
Here's one, if you can see it in the camera. Not the fire, not the fire, but the, uh, the spider. And of course, a lot of us have uh, a little bit of arachnophobia. You know, it's, it's a natural, <laughs> very natural, seemingly natural fear. Um, you may not be able to see it, but you can see the, the, the photo of the, the spider. Okay, and I'm going to read the, read the remark underneath it, now that you've seen the picture. What are your rational and irrational fears? Do you know the difference? That's something that a lot of people don't get an opportunity to think about. Right. What kind of irrational fears and irrational fears do people that you know have? What have you observed over the years as far as fears that are rational or irrational? And how do people know the difference? Well, I think the difference is the hard part. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I've had friends who've almost crashed their cars because mm -hmm. there's a spider. That, that's uh, understanding that spiders are not fun and, mm -hmm. and yummy, like yay creatures, but at the same time, almost getting into an accident because you have one in the car, totally, you know, irrational. Um, yeah. Speaking in front of people, like that was my fear. I'm realizing that it's, it's, it is kind of an irrational fear. I mean, it's not like they're going to come and, you know, rush me for not saying what they like to say and so forth, but it is, it's a confidence thing. So I guess in the moment of your fear, you have to decide whether or not, can it really kill you? This segues <laughs> well. I had a show on a couple of months ago with uh, a good friend of mine, Beth Girelli, um, talking about anxiety because she's a psychologist and she deals with people and, and their anxieties and, and kind of coaches them through that. Um, I also had with me uh, Mitch, Mitch Fuchs, who is a politician, and we talked about, again, speaking in, in public speaking. Mm -hmm. And of course, Wayne and I have an opportunity to do that in Toastmasters. But um, things that people can do in order to get them through that anxiety that comes along with, oh, there's a bunch of people out there, and I don't know who they are. Right. I don't know how they're going to perceive me. How do you block that out? What do you do? I mean, I, there's things that I've learned to do, like with these three cameras that, I, that, <laughs> that, we, uh, that we, we try to ignore, right. as you're doing a very good job of. But um, what do people do? I mean, what, what kind of thing is there to do to get around that? Well, I think that sometimes when you have it, like Wayne, Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect yeah. example. He is one of those people who have realized that he is confident in himself. Mm -hmm. That when he gets up to speak, he never speaks unless he knows what he's speaking of. Uh -huh. And so that, I guess, for him would be the way that he managed to not be ever afraid of, of speaking in public. So in other words, you have, you have so much preparation that when you get up in front of people to speak, you can throw caution to the wind because you have nothing to worry about. Exactly. And, and some people have the brain to be able to really memorize things and know things. And when you don't, I think that becomes a fear too, is that I would love to be good at this. I would love to be able to say this, but do I have the memory? Do I have the capabilities? And so that becomes one of the things that you have to get over. And for me, I decided that that I was cool enough, <laughs> that I'm cool, I, I can do this. Yeah. Like I know what I'm talking about when it pertains to, to what I'm passionate about. Yeah. And, and maybe you're not passionate about whatever you're talking about, but you have to be for that minute. And that maybe yeah. that could break you through, you know, the, the fear factor, just become passionate for a minute, mm -hmm. even if it's, you know, high school student talking about, you know, Roosevelt, yeah. just, just love them for that minute and make it yeah. everything and, you know, kind of get over it and then realize at the end of it, okay, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> uh, makes sense to me. <laughs> I, I, I have much, much um, admiration for, for people who have the ability to just get up on, on a stage and just speak. And, and yes, watching Wayne with his Toastmaster things and you guys, I, I'm, I'm in awe. I genuflect in your general direction and I would love to be able to, to have that kind of skill. But that's where the fear factor comes in, and I'm See, making I'm, it go away. I'm the opposite way. I'm the opposite way. If, if I have a speech memorized, because I've given a couple speeches at Toastmasters, and, and, and I get up on stage, and no matter how much I've memorized it, I still have to kind of look at it, and, and, it, and it, it's much easier for me when I'm extemporaneous, and I just let what I'm saying go. I have like a, a little bit of an outline of what, what we're talking about or what I'm talking about. Right. But it's easier for me when it's, when it's as unscripted as, as humanly possible mm -hmm. and still be able to touch on a few points that I, that I want to touch on. 
But um, do you speak at all in front of people? I work in a doctor's office, so I speak. You speak in all front day. of a lot of people, then. Exactly. Okay. That must be exciting. Sorry. <coughs> <laughs> Good timing with that. <coughs> of course. <laughs> I do. I love my job. I yeah. speak all day. I work in insurance. Yeah. So I am the person that speaks to everyone in the office. So okay. Yeah. I speak a lot all day to people, and it's easy because I know what I'm talking about. Sorry. That's okay. So um, that makes it easier when you know what you're talking about, I think, for yeah. me anyways. So let's get back to, um, if I could, let's get back to um, your daughter and the process of her growing up versus the process of you or Wayne growing up or you growing up. And looking backwards, how could this book have helped you? I mean, you're helping other people by the book. Right. Let's go back in time, and how could it? Have, how, do you think it would have changed your life to, to to have had the book to as guidance? Oh, most definitely. Mm -hmm. I don't. Okay. I think that I. Uh, I think I lacked um, some guidance. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was a working mom, and and of that generation, we were all kind of you know latchkey kids. Yep. We came home, we took care of ourselves. I actually helped, you know raise my brother so I kind of did everything on the fly mm -hmm. and love my mom dearly no you know animosity but I definitely could have used some some guidance and some some assurance and those kind of things and I think that her watching me a put this together yeah. B going through it and my looking at her and looking at myself going exactly that what could she use someday what could she what could she benefit from and and questioning herself is definitely one of those things and I don't think I think that I had a fear mm -hmm. in questioning myself because I didn't know the answers I didn't know if the answers were right and what if I found the answer and I didn't know what to do with it that's the worst like I have the answer now and where where do I go so that's really she has been a great great joy and knowing that I have prepared some steps before her and and when I'm not here, she'll still know. Yeah. So that's been, it's been fun. And it's been great that she's been involved in it. Her picture is actually in there. And so it's kind of been fun to be able to incorporate her that. So it's, I like, I, I love her. And like I said, she, she has been a huge inspiration for me. Children are a lot of fun raising. She really is. And you know what, I, I knew, it's in my book, I knew that I wanted to be a mom from when I was like 11 years old. Like as soon as I knew I could become a mom. And so in school, you know when they did those projects where you had to make a poster of who yeah. you were gonna be? I would make things up because you couldn't just say you wanted to be a mom yeah. because nobody understood that. So I would pretend I'd want to be a botanist or an equestrian because then I could make really cool pictures. Mm -hmm. It's not really what I wanted to do. And then basically she she was exactly what I had always wanted. I also always wanted a girl for no other reason, just because I wanted a little girl. So I was blessed with a daughter. And yeah, excellent. She's a cool kid. <laughs> she's a really cool kid. What else do you want to talk about? What do I want to talk about? Um, I I think that what we were kind of talking about that whole change and mm -hmm. affecting change and things. I think that. There are so many people that I know right this second who are going through things and keep asking the whys mm -hmm. um, to the world, but not necessarily the whys to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's, it's kind of time for us to kind of give up um, in the best of ways for other people to come in and rescue us from mm -hmm. this situation. Yeah. Um, like the whole idea that the economy is going to get better and all of a sudden our employers are going to rehire mm -hmm. the jobs that we're now doing, yeah. it, it's not going to happen. We're, our, our employers are glad now that we are doing those jobs for what we're being paid for. Yeah. And for as much as the economy may change, that's probably not a part of what's going to happen. So let's start looking at what we're doing um, in the best of ways. And even if it's to take on a project maybe that you hadn't you know, you'd put on the back burner and hadn't thought about it. How about doing it? How about, you know, I have friends that, um, who want to make uh, pound cake. It's, it's the silliest thing. Yeah. They, she's from um, 
another country mm -hmm. and has this great recipe for pound cake. Wherever we go, there's a pound cake. Yeah. And it wasn't until I decided to do this book that she realized she had to act and not just think about it. And so it's little things like that. For her, she wants to be able to make it and, and distribute it and not necessarily do it nationwide, but, you know, make it, you know, uh, something profitable for her family. So I just kind of think that families in general and personally, like, kind of have to relook at what's going on in their lives. You know, if you're not happy where you work, maybe you can't quit, but maybe you can start doing something on your own time that's going to make you happy. It sounds like there's a lot of don't be a, a planner, be a doer yeah. in that. And, and that strikes a very, very strong nerve for us here on the show because we, we all got the training at Comcast and uh, we had a show in planning, I would say for six months at least, planning on how to do it and planning and planning and planning. Mm -hmm. And finally, of us, we just decided that, um, hey, you know what? Let's go to the studio and let's do a show Right. And see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And once we started doing that, it all fell into place. Exactly. And we found that um, we learned as we went. We found that um, it, was, it was kind of exciting. We found that we made some mistakes on the stage. We made some mistakes in the studio. And yet at the same time, those mistakes weren't really that horrendous. Exactly. And after all, it's public access TV. <laughs> and who's watching anyway? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to... I don't mean to begrudge the audience, but uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for watching. <laughs> We're doing our best. Thank so you. yeah, um, so actually doing rather than planning. Exactly. What and even if concept. it doesn't come out good the first time, do it again yeah. and do it again and do it again and just do it because it makes you feel good and because now you found that little bit of joy that you didn't have yesterday. And how cool is that, you know? Like maybe this show is the show that you go, oh, cool, we, yeah. we did a good job this. We figured that part out. Yay. And it goes to the next one. And, and practice makes better. It doesn't, there's no perfect. Exactly. The plan for perfection is, is, to, is to never accomplish anything. Exactly. But by doing, you learn and, and, and expand your horizons. And uh, we've only got a minute left, but I have to tell a real quick story before we, before we sign off. Um, not necessarily a big fan of Joel Osteen, you know, mm -hmm. um, he's a minister, but I saw one show by, just by chance on a Sunday morning, and he sounded very liberal to me in the sense of being open-minded, which is a classic definition of liberal. He said, you know, if you don't think you like the opera, go to the opera. You might find that you like it. If you don't think you like, if you think you don't like fishing, try it. By doing things that you're not used to doing, by hanging with people that may not think exactly like you, you expand your horizons and you open yourself up to some new things. And I think with that, we're going to have to close down and say, this has been Progressive Soup, April Dawn Winsley. I'm David Stevenson. Thank you for the production crew, and uh, good night. <laughs>